Hey, what's up everyone and welcome to another very exciting video. Today, we're going to be talking about Super Mario Brothers on the NES. Super Mario was released in 1995 in Japan and the United States. It wasn't until 1997, two years later, that European countries like Australia would receive the game. Super Mario Brothers was designed by the legendary Shigeru Miyamoto and his sidekick, Takashi Tezuka. If video games were religion, Super Mario would be Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, as he single-handedly revived the video game market in North America. And subsequently, the world. Super Mario had previously been featured in such games like Mario Brothers the Arcade Game and Donkey Kong, where he was known as Jumpman. I know what you're thinking. How did they get from Jumpman to Mario? One of the landlords of Nintendo's warehouses in America was named Mario Sigali. So, that's where the name comes from. One of the things that made Super Mario stand out from its competitors in 1985 was its gameplay and its amazing soundtrack. There was nothing out there like this out at the time. One of the things that made Super Mario stand out so much was the way he moved. Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka gave him special abilities. These abilities would give Super Mario the ability to perform great athletic feats. These abilities would go on to be enhanced as you play through the game. Now, a lot's been said about the first level in Super Mario Brothers. They say it serves as the perfect tutorial on how to play the game. I played this game a lot growing up and I never really saw it as a tutorial. It was just one of those things that was so well designed that you just knew how to play it. And that's what good video game design looks like. You can just pick it up and play the game. That first level, it encouraged exploration and experimentation. You can tell by the evil eyes on the Goomba that you didn't want him to hit you. You can tell by those block with question marks that you wanted to hit those things. You'd see a mushroom come out of it. And when you saw that mushroom coming out of it, you knew you wanted to pick it up. Next thing you knew, you were Super Mario and you had acquired the ability to break bricks. And then you started breaking bricks for the fun of it. And then you would stumble across a green mushroom that would give you a life. You'd go through the game and you'd discover two more abilities. My personal favorite, the Fire Flower, and the Invincibility Star. And before you knew it, you'd be experimenting using pipes to see where they would take you. And it wasn't long before you were discovering the secret shortcuts in the legendary worlds of 1-2, and eventually 4-2. Not only did this game encourage exploration, but one of the side effects was social interaction. You'd wind up talking to people on the schoolyard during recess about the secrets of the Mushroom Kingdom. That's just how we found out about these things back then. There was no internet. We had to talk to each other and learn from each other's experiences about the secrets of the Mushroom Kingdom. It was either that or you had to call the Nintendo hotline. It wasn't until the internet where I'd find out about the unlimited one-ups. One of the things that made Super Mario stand out from his 1985 rivals was the color palette. Video games back then. For some reason, they would all feature black backgrounds. It wasn't until Super Mario where we'd see a blue sky in a video game. But not just that, it was a more fleshed out environment. It had trees, some levels took place in the dark. And if you just so happened to go down a pipe, you would see the sewers from the Mushroom Kingdom. Now, the enemies in this game. They were also a diverse crew. There were Goombas, you had to jump on them. There were turtles that you can jump on. However, there were also turtles that you couldn't jump on the game required you to exercise common sense. There were even turtles that you couldn't even defeat with a fire flower. And as a child, I always had an affinity for the Hammer Brothers. I just thought they looked cool. They just stopped you in your tracks and made you stop and think and wait for the right time to strike. This game also does feature multiplayer functionality. However, in 1985 on a home console, that simply meant player one would play until he died and then it was player two's turn. So it wasn't the handiest of functions. Unless of course you were super keen to play as Luigi. Now for the music. What can I say about this game's soundtrack that hasn't already been said? The soundtrack of this game is nothing short of iconic. I would grow up to hear this music being played in the biggest clubs in Melbourne. The soundtrack to this game left a huge cultural impact on our planet. I mean, can you name a more iconic song from 1985 without Googling it. No, I didn't think so. The Super Mario Brothers was successful because it had all the hallmarks of what makes a great video game. It was accessible. You just knew how to play it. It had good graphics. I mean, these were good graphics in 1985. And the sound design was nothing short of iconic. This game is 100% worth playing through today. Super Mario Brothers was actually the first video game I ever played. My neighbor, Ya, she had an NES. And this one day she was babysitting me. So she sat me down and let me play this game. And that was the beginning of my journey as a gamer. Y'all, yeah, if you're out there, 
Thank you. What are your experiences with the Super Mario franchise? Let me know in the comment section below. Anyways, that's it from me. See ya.